I'm going to be sharing with you my testimony today. But before that, we need to do a little Bible study. You know I like Bible studies. Um, I want to let you know that uh, the doctrines <clears throat> of the Seventh-day Adventist Church changed my life. Uh, they are what helped to make me a new creation. In fact, they are what helped me to find my true identity. So we're going to begin with a, with a short Bible study. And we're going to we're gonna study just briefly the doctrine of the second coming, um, the doctrine of the state of the dead, the doctrine of hellfire, the doctrine of the sanctuary, the doctrine of the Sabbath. Just briefly. <laughs> I just want to make sure that you guys were on the same page and we have the same understanding because uh, I believe that many winds of doctrine are blowing in our church today. And people are, are, um, are being deceived by some of the very most basic doctrines. We need to make sure that we are firmly rooted and grounded in what we believe and why we believe it. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless us as we open your word. And bless us, Lord, as we hear of your power to change lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church are very important. They define who we are. Let's start with the second coming. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles very quickly to John chapter 14. And I'll read verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Why? Because I'm coming again. Now, let me ask you, do you think that that, that, that command of Christ relates to all areas of life? You know, does, is, he, is he saying, let not your heart be troubled? Does that statement apply to every area of your life? So when you're going through trial, when you're going through tribulation, he still says, let not your heart be troubled. Why? Because I'm coming again. What is a Seventh-day Adventist? One who believes in the coming of Jesus Christ and one who celebrates or honors the Sabbath day. Amen? So, so Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. And I want you to think about this because the Bible tells us that there is coming a time of trouble such as never was. But yet, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Why? Because when I come again, I will save you out of your trouble. Amen? Amen. Jesus' second coming is important to us because it saves us out of our trouble. So let's talk about the second coming. We know that according to Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, <laughs> when Jesus comes again, he comes with the clouds. Amen? You believe that? Amen. The Bible also tells us in the same verse that when Jesus comes again, every eye will see him. Do you believe that? Are you sure you believe that? You don't sound convinced that you believe that. You're looking at me like, Pastor, or, or, is something wrong with you? Do you know who you're talking to? We are Seventh-day Adventists. You don't need to ask us that twice, but I'm going to ask you again. When Jesus comes again, does every eye see him? Are you sure about that? When Jesus comes again, the righteous are brought to what? Life and what happens to the wicked? The wicked perish. Are you with me? Man, you guys sound like you're just like, mm -hmm, we got this, let's move. <laughs> okay, so the wicked perish. We also know that Satan, what happens to him when Jesus comes again? Is he bound? So he can deceive the nations no more. Is that correct? And then we are changed, amen, in the moment in what? The twinkling of an eye, and we are caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air to go to heaven, amen. amen. All things, the old world is passed away, amen? amen? 
Now, what is the counterfeit of the second coming? The counterfeit of the second coming is called the secret rapture, okay? Now, in the secret rapture, what do they teach? When Jesus comes, you don't see him. Now, someone tells you that Jesus comes, the Bible says that if they say to you he's in a secret chamber, believe it not. Are you with me? Are you sure? Are you sure over there? Wow, they're not sure over there. <laughs> uh, is everyone in here sure? Yes. When, if someone tells you Jesus c- has come and you don't see it with your own eyes, don't believe it. Amen? Amen. All right. When Jesus comes, is, is it a secret? No. If someone tells you he came but it's a secret, you know that it is a lie. lie. It is a what, everyone? Lie. It is a lie. When Jesus comes again, will Satan still be on the loose? No, he's what? He's bound. So we know that if Satan is still on the loose, that Jesus has not what? Come again. Very good. And um, when Satan's on the loose, he's allowed to continue to deceive and to lead into, you know, to, to lead the world in deception. When Jesus comes, that comes to an end. Amen? All right. Very good. So we got one down. We got just a few more to go. Let's talk about this, the, um, the, the teaching of hellfire because along with the second coming is the teaching of hey guys can i tell you something don't lose me here i'm not saying you're not paying attention i'm just saying you're probably thinking to yourself right now okay pastor we got this but you don't have this so just follow me okay all right so so the second coming i'm sorry the the annihilation of the wicked we know that when the wicked are destroyed we call that the second death is that correct and, and we know that when, when, when uh, hellfire occurs, it is for the purpose of total annihilation. Amen? Amen? The wicked perish forever. There is no returning from the second death. Are you with me so far? Amen. Amen. So, uh, when the wicked perish, they are turned into what? They are turned into ashes, right? Uh, the counterfeit of that is that the wicked continue to do what? Continue to live. They're immortal. They don't die. Okay. Are you guys good with that? Very good. Okay. Let's talk about the state of the dead. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, uh, and 6. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. So when a, when a person dies, how much do they know? How much do they remember? All right. They have no knowledge. They, they can't feel. You can't. If, if someone is speaking to you, That is supposed to be dead, you know that it is spiritualism. It is a lie. Amen? Very good. Very good. Okay, uh, let's see. We've got the Sabbath. That's a good one. The purpose of the Sabbath is what? To remember, right, the fact that God has created Right? He created the world in six days. So the celebration of the Sabbath is a celebration of God's creative act. Amen? Amen. But is that it alone? No, no, no. It's, it was also for the children of Israel to remember that God had delivered them out of bondage. So the Sabbath serves two purposes. One, that God has creative power. And two, that he can deliver. Amen. Amen. All right. So we've got the Sabbath. We also have prophecy. And, um, you know, I remember when I first learned about the, the, the beast from Revelation that had the horns of a lamb that spake like a dragon, how that represented apostate Protestantism, right? And how, though they appeared uh, to be a Christian nation, uh, it actually is working on behalf of another power, right? So I learned about that. We learned about that. Amen? We got that? All right, let's do one more. The sanctuary. Purpose of the sanctuary is, or the purpose of the doctrine of the sanctuary is, is basically what we call the 2300-day prophecy where the Bible says unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be what? Be cleansed. The temple will be cleansed. All right. Did I lose anyone? Everybody good? Praise the Lord. Let's talk about my testimony. You're like, Pastor, we just did a Bible study for nothing. Hold on. Um, these, these teachings changed my life. I did not know what a Seventh-day Adventist was until I was 21 years old. Let me tell you my story. I was born on the island of Jamaica. 
And uh, yeah, I knew I was going to get that here. And um, <clears throat> my parents were not Adventist, so you know I'm not a 2G or 3G or 4G. <laughs> Um, my parents did not even, they, they, they did not go to church, so our family wasn't a religious family. I'm number three of four boys. When I was born, um, let me say this way, that even though we were not a religious family, <clears throat> I could see God working in our lives. I could see that God had a purpose for me from a very young age, even though I did not know who God was. So uh, some of my favorite stories I like to tell is that when I was born, uh, I was a very fair-skinned baby. So I looked like I was a white baby. And I'll tell you why I share that in a moment, because when I was about eight months old, my mother um, took me to the beach. She was with a couple of other family members, my uncle, some other people. And something like really crazy happened, because my mom, uh, she had me in a little baby carriage, and she got into the water thinking that my uncle was watching me. My uncle got into the water thinking that my mother was watching me. So neither of them were watching me, but somebody else was watching me. And my mom's in the water, and something tells her to turn around. She turns around, and all she sees is my little baby carriage disappearing over the horizon. I was being kidnapped. Don't worry, I am here. <laughs> I always have to let people know that, because they're like, oh! What happened? <clears throat> I'm here. Um, my mom gets, starts screaming, and my uncle jumps out of the water and starts going after whoever had taken me. He caught the people. It was a couple. <clears throat> and um, they told him that they were just taking me for a walk. <laughs> so here's the funny part. It was a white couple. I often think, what would have happened when they realized they grabbed the wrong child? <laughs> what? I thought you... you. So, so God was intervening in my life even before I knew him. Um, my father had been in the military, and uh, growing up in the military, or you know, growing up with a military father, um, you know, my father would often have uh, uh, you know, trouble with uh, the local drug dealers, Rastafarians. So I grew up with my father saying stuff like, my kids will never have dreadlocks. Because, <laughs> you know, it was just associated with, with the Rastafarians. So um, I remember one, well, I don't remember this, but when I was about four years old, my younger brother, uh, th 11 months younger than me, uh, he was, well, he was three, I was four. My older brother was about 11 years old or 10 years old, somewhere around there. And he was getting ready to go outside to play. My father had been gone on some kind of expedition. And before he got to the front door, he noticed that at either side of the door, there were two armed men. These were local drug dealers who had basically come to, like, wipe out our family. And what ended up happening is he goes back and tells my mom, Mom, there's two guys outside with guns. And then my neighbors on either side saw what was going on. So this big shootout happens. And by the grace of God, none of us were hurt. It was that incident that led my parents to decide that we're leaving Jamaica. And then we, we basically came to uh, or moved to the United States of America to a place known as Little Jamaica or Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> And, and there in Brooklyn, New York, my younger brother and I, we were introduced to something called hip-hop. We saw kids spinning on their heads and doing all these weird moves and dressing this, this way. We were just not, we were just, it was totally new to us, and we were mesmerized by, by it. Now, let me tell you something. When I came from Jamaica to the United States of America, I had some, 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 some issues. Number one, my Jamaican accent was so heavy my older brother tells me that Jamaicans couldn't understand me. The patois was that bad. So, so what ended up happening is that every time I opened my mouth to speak, the kids would laugh at me because they didn't understand what I was saying. And as a result of that, I developed this intense fear of public speaking. Number two, 
my name was different from everybody else's name, Ivor. Worst day of school for me was the first day of school. Because everybody would, you know, the roll call. Teacher would be, you know, Henry here, Michael here, Thomas here, Tina here. And then at the teacher face would do something like this. And I would just kind of sink in my seat because I knew it was coming. And then he would say something like, Igor? I get, I go. And the kids would break out laughing. So I hated my accent. I hated my name. By the way, I was so ashamed about my accent that I started to work to get rid of my Jamaican accent. That's why you don't hear it now. Or maybe you do a little bit. But I got rid of the accent by about sixth grade. And in that very year, it suddenly became popular to be Jamaican. <laughs> like in that year, everybody just became Jamaican. People I knew were not Jamaican were suddenly Jamaican. And I'm like, I just lost my accent. What? Like, you know, so the, the American thing had just like kicked in. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I hated my name. I hated my accent. And you can see what God is, what, what Satan is doing with identity. Right? So, so um, I remember that I... Even had a teacher one day, his name was Mr. Tubin. I remember he was walking around in class, I'm like in second grade or third grade or something like that, and he comes up to me and he looks down at my face and he's like, hmm, the face only a mother could love. And I didn't understand what that meant, and when I did, it was just like, okay, now, like, I really have no confidence in myself at all. My brother and I learned that through breakdancing, we, we could make friends. And so that's what we started doing. We started getting really, 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 you know, deep down into hip hop and break dancing. And so, um, you know, life is going on. We, we don't go to church. My first religious experience came at the age of 12 years old. And at 12 years old, I had a cousin. Uh, I met a cousin who, who was from England. She came to the United States, and we were meeting her for the first time. She was about 14 years old, and I was about 12. My brother's 11, and we connected immediately. Um, you know, what we didn't know about her, her name is Susan. What we didn't know about Susan was that she was a Christian. And so, you know, she would talk to us about the Bible, and we'd be like, oh, that's pretty cool. Didn't have a Bible, didn't read the Bible, so she would just tell us stuff. Well, all right, cool. So one day, we're home alone, me, my brother, and Susan, about you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, my parents are out to work, and Susan starts to talk to us about the Bible. But this is not like any other regular talk that we would have. This time, she's talking to us about the book of Revelation. And when someone starts to tell you about beasts coming up out of the ocean with horns and different things like that, and your parents aren't home, you can get a little nervous. And so here I am, you know, she's talking, and then she says this. She says, and... There's something in the Bible called the mark of the beast. And I know what the mark of the beast is. Do you want, know, want to know what the mark of the beast is? And at that point, my brother and I, we just started trembling. Let me tell you why. That summer, before Susan came, my brother and I had just watched a movie about a little boy who discovers he is the Antichrist. The little boy is from England. <laughs> and we're like, England, England. And anyone who discovers the identity of this little boy who has 666 tattooed in his head dies a horrendous, super painful, long, drawn out, you should have never discovered my identity type of death. So like, get, you know, a person would get hit by a truck, but they wouldn't die. A crow would come out of nowhere, and it's pecking the person, the eye, and they're like, ah, 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 and this was going on for like minutes. So I was like, I never want to know what the mark of the beast is. And here she is in my house. I know what the mark of the beast is. Do you want to know what the mark of the beast is? And I'm like, all right, we're about to die. We're about to die. So I'm like, I, like my head felt like it went like no, but, she, but my mouth said yes. So she begins to tell me that there are certain companies that produce soap boxes. Anyone, anyone ever see? And on these soap boxes, there's a circle with a half moon and a man's face in it. That is the mark of the beast. And I'm like, we're about to die. And then she's like, do you have a soap box in your house? And I'm like, oh. so we're like, yes, Susan. She's like, where is it? And I'm like, it's in the basement. 
She's like, let's go. And off we go. And I promise you, I hear the, st- the steps are creaking. And I hear the horror music playing in the background. Because I'm like, we're about to die. So we get down. And I'm like, Susan, there's the box. My brother and I start backing up. She goes to the box. She takes it. She turns. She looks at it. She looks at us. And she's like, there it is. My brother and I see the circle with the half moon and the man's face in it. We run out the house screaming. Because we're thinking the house is going to drop. We're in the middle of the road, in our pajamas, crying, screaming, while my cousin is literally dying from laughter. (laughs) We're looking out for trucks, crows, all kinds of stuff, right? And after like, you know, 10 minutes pass and like nothing happened, we were like, whoa, okay. And I remember thinking to myself, whoa, well, you know what? What, I'm still alive. One day I'd really like to learn more about this mark of the beast thing because I didn't know that it was real. God was planting a seed. I get to uh, the ninth grade, and in the ninth grade, I discovered something. I discovered that I could change my name. So I'm in the ninth grade now. I'm not going by Ivor anymore. I want to change my identity. So I get to ninth grade. Yo, yo, what's your name, yo? Yo, Me? Yeah, you. You want to know my name? I got you, let me set you up. So that's me when I came to the States, me and my little brother. Don't say the face only a mother could love. <laughs> All right? What's your name? Passion. <laughs> What'd you say? What's your name? Passion. <laughs> So now I'm in ninth grade, right, and, and, and I'm in high school, and this is, I'm passion, identity. So, we, my brother and I get deeper and deeper into the hip-hop thing, and in the 10th grade, my parents decide they're moving from New York to a place called Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, and you got to understand, for a black man to move to a place that ends in Berg, which is in the South, was a very scary thought for us. We ended up going to, uh, an, we left the all-black school to go to a, an all-white, we were the only black people in an all-white school. So we're thinking, oh man, it's going to be, oh, we're, we were so the only black people in all-white school that on the first day of school, the principal came up to us and said, can I help you? <laughs> we're students here. Oh, oh, welcome, welcome, welcome. So we get there and like immediately the kids in the school are like, you're from New York? We're like, yeah, we're from New York. <laughs> they thought we were stars just because we were from New York. So they just treated us like that. I mean, they like loved us. New York, New York. Yeah, yeah, yo. All right? <laughs> New York, all right? So we, we, at the same time, there was another young man that had just moved from Brooklyn, New York. And uh, so we, we met him in the school, and he was in the hip-hop. We were in the hip-hop. We decided we were going to form a hip-hop group. And so we started entering talent shows. Every talent show we entered, we came in first place. And people started saying, you guys are going to make it famous. You're going to make it big. And we were like, we hope that happens before we graduate from high school so that we do not have to go to college. We just want to live that life. Well, that didn't happen, and off we went to college. When I get to college, I changed my name again. Because passion was like high school. You know, that's high school. This is 1990. And in the hip-hop field, it was like, you know, it was all about the dashiki and, you know, you know, the black man is God and all that kind of stuff. So I get to Virginia State University, black college, and they're like, yo, 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 what's your name, man? What's my name? <laughs> Africa. Met a whole bunch of friends at Virginia State University, and we formed a crew. The name of our crew, there's some of them right there. Name of our crew, (laughs) X-Men. So all we would do is drink, smoke, and then we would like go to parties, and um, we'd get into fights. And the battle cry for the fight, 
you know, if one of us was someplace and the other, you know, you know we would yell, X-Men! And that was the battle cry. <laughs> if any man be in Christ. <laughs> I remember one time I was in the cafeteria, and um, I, had, I, had a, I had an issue with a football player. And so at the time, I was, you know, you know 20 years old, not very, not very big, and this football player was like a truck. And he came up to me in the cafeteria was like, yo, man, would you? You know, it was over, you know, some girl. So I was like, look, man, like I wasn't afraid of him at all. Why? Because my uncle trained under a man named Wing, uh, William Chung, who was the classmate of Bruce Lee, who both were taught by Yip Man, who was a grandmaster of Wing Chun, and he taught me. What? <laughs> so I'm like, football player or not, man, I will, I will lay you down. <laughs> so he's going on, and I'm like, whatever, man. So I walk away, and none of my friends were in the cafeteria, just one guy. One of my friends, and I went down, sat at the table, and he was like, what happened over there? I was like, man, this guy, whatever, whatever. And as I'm talking, I hear this commotion in the background. And I look up behind me, and this guy is full speed coming at me. And I'm like, no, he, no you did not just approach Africa like that. <laughs> I get up out of my chair, and I get in my Bruce Lee stance like, what? <laughs> when I notice that the entire football team is behind him, and they're all coming at me. And I'm like, no problem. Bruce Lee takes out 30 at a time. <laughs> the whole team jumps on me. And fists are flying everywhere, not mine. I'm at the bottom of the rubble. And I promise you, I'm like this. I wonder what's going on up there because nobody's touching me. <laughs> like literally. And then I feel myself begin to move. And the, I'm in the center of this, of this riot, and the whole thing is moving, and then the cafeteria door opens. I get put outside the cafeteria door, and then it shuts. Pandemonium still going on inside. Little do I know enough about angels to realize that I, my life was just saved. No, 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 no. What do I do? I go to the nearest phone, and I call up the X-Men. We got beef. <laughs> and that night, like a hundred of my friends... I'm just going to leave it there, <laughs> if any man be in Christ. <laughs> we entered, oh, before I tell you that. So we, uh, we, we, one of my friends called me over one day. I used to be in heavy in the house music as well. I don't know if you guys know what house music is. Heavy dance music. So we were house dancers as well, my brother and I. And, um, and he called me one day, yo, Africa, you got to come hear this song. And I was like, what? He's like, come, you got to hear this song. So I go over to his house, and he puts this song on. And it's this song that I recognized the words because I, I knew that it was from the Bible. And here were the words. And he opened the sixth seal and lo. And I, I didn't hear anything else. I was like, that's from the Bible. But the crazy thing was that it was a demonic voice that was playing over. It was a demonic voice that was speaking. So I knew that it was mocking the Bible, but for some reason I got this idea in my head, huh, I had this idea. So after I left his house, I went home and I called up all the X-Men, my whole crew, like 40 of us. I was like, yo, I got this idea, man. They were like, what? I was like, why don't we get together and read the whole book of Revelation tonight? And they were like, okay. <laughs> I don't even know where we got a Bible from. That night we got the Bible with our marijuana and started reading and smoking and read and we just passed the, the, the Bible and the marijuana around. We read through the whole, and let me tell you, we were blown away. <laughs> we read the whole, and at the end of that, <clears throat> that night, we were like, hey, we know what we're going to do. We're going to start putting lyrics from Revelation into our hip hop music. That's going to be our special edge. A few weeks later, we enter a talent show at Howard University. And in that talent show, there were 40 contestants. Out of those 40 contestants, uh, our group came in first place. And it was there that uh, there were some scouts there from New York City. They said, hey, we want to take your demo. We want to take you to New York City and shop it and try to get you a record deal. Well, long story short, in a matter of just a few days, we were signed to a major recording contract with EMI Records. Eight albums, one million dollars. By the way, I changed my name again. <laughs> my, my name now, 
was uh, Yoda. Star Wars. <laughs> What's your name? Yoda. So my red beard, red dreadlocks, walked on with a red cane, like, yeah, man, I'm Yoda. <laughs> The name of our, of our hip-hop group, Boogie Monsters. My brother's name, Jedi. <laughs> so we got to New York City, and we're like, yeah, we have now made it. I mean, my parents didn't want us to drop out of school, but, you know, Jamaican parents, you're going to get your education. We're like, Mom, Dad, you got to understand, this is a real record deal. So they let us go. Off to New York City we went. And we're just hanging out, man, having the time of our life. We're meeting the stars that we only saw on TV. We're, meeting, we're rubbing shoulders with hip-hop artists that we were listening to their records. And, and now we, have, we think we have made it big. And then, and then, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And then, one night, a friend of mine, because we would have people come over all the time, people we didn't know, friends of friends, and one night, a friend of ours brought a friend of his to our house. And he said to me, um, I mean, we, you know, we met him and, you know, we're like, hey, we're all about 21, 19, 20, 21 at the time. And this guy, he's got dreadlocks looking just like us. Yo, 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 what up, yo? And so we're there talking. And this night we happened to be talking about the mark of the beast because that was like the new world order. And we were talking about, you know, in hip hop, it was, you know, kind of like the thing to talk about, you know, new world order, watch out, man, they're going to get the black man. So we're talking all this, right? You know, watch out for soapboxes, man, I'm telling you. You know, they're going to put the mark on you, right? So we're there having this discussion, and this friend of our friend is listening, and then he asks this question, hey, can I ask you a question? And we're like, yeah. He was like, what day do you think the Sabbath is? So we look at our friend like, who did you bring here? <laughs> What kind of a, here we are having a serious discussion about soapboxes and the mark of the beast, and this guy wants to know what day the Sabbath is. So we're like looking at him funny. We're like, Saturday, I mean, Sunday, everybody knows that. And so we kind of high-fived each other and went back to our conversation, and he's like, think again. And we're like, think again. He's like, what's the first day of the week? We were like, whoa, Sunday? He was like, what's the seventh day of the week? We were like, Sunday? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. We were like, wait a minute. What would you just do? And listen to me. This guy, from memory, we're all smoking. This guy, from memory, begins to break down for us. Daniel chapter 7. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, little horn, thinking to change times and laws. Let me tell you something. It was like the Holy Spirit, in th that, that there was a cloud in our, in our house of smoke, but it was like the smoke of the Holy Spirit penetrated that den and grabbed our minds. We ended up having a four-hour Bible study like that night. And, and, and from that night on, we started, every night you came into that house, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, we were mesmerized by what we were learning. Blown away. Blown away. I think it was after like a week that we were like, what are you, man? And he's like, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And we were like, a what? What is that? See, let me tell you a little funny thing. Like, we didn't know that he, you know, that he belonged to a church. Like, if he, he knew the Bible so well that if he told us, yeah, I'm the Messiah, we would have been like, yeah, and we are his disciples. Don't touch him. <laughs> I mean, we just, we didn't know he belonged to a church. Because, you know, growing up in New York, you hear people preaching on street corners all the time. And I was a skeptic of all religion. I was like, that's stupid, that's stupid, that doesn't make sense. And if Christianity is true, why all these different denominations? It's all just a hoax, really. But this thing blew our minds. We're like, what are you? I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. We're like, all right, this Saturday, we're coming to church with you. So I want you to imagine. <laughs> 20 to 30. Dreadlocked, pants, sagging, gum chewing, cane carrying. <laughs> <laughs> When we walked up in that church in Queens, New York, 
it was a small church. You should have seen the looks on their faces. Because <laughs> they didn't know where we were coming from. And we're walking in there like, all right, all right, true, true, true. Okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. And we get there, and we're like so excited because, I mean, when we sat down, we didn't sit down like this. We sat down like this. All right. Let's see what he's going to say. Because if anything, like what you've been talking We sat down, and the preacher started preaching. Beloved, remember, remember that Jesus is Lord. Oh, did you hear that? No, no, no. Did you hear what he just said? He just said that Jesus. Je- <sighs> Beloved, remember, remember that the Sabbath is the seventh day. No, 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 he didn't just, did you hear what he just said? And, and we would just be losing it. Anything said, remember to pay your tithe. Oh, boy, we got to warn the world. No one ever told us about tithe. And, and we were, we were kind of confused because while we were like, what, did you hear that? Everybody else was like this. And we're like, wait, 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 they must, they, must, they must not just heard what the pastor just said. And we were confused because it was like, how are you sitting there so silent? Yo, do you hear this truth? Do you, do you? Do... Beloved, that was 20 years ago, 22 years ago. I, I still... <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, God. (laughs) Beloved, let me tell you something. You are sitting on truths that other people are willing to give anything to grab hold of. But when other people come and they see, because you're not like this at the basketball game, you're not like this about soccer. I'm sorry, football. <laughs> You're not like this about, but... He... See, beloved, we got to start treating our truth more precious. We were so blown away by what we were hearing. We decided, we know what we're going to do. We're going to take the three angels' messages, and we're going to put it in our hip-hop music. So now we're in the clubs on Friday night. And we're performing, right? And, and in the middle of our performance, we, we would perform with backpacks on. So we'd be performing and doing our thing. And then we'd be like, in the middle of our performance, we'd stop. Who wants to know who the man of sin is? Throw your hands in the air. Everybody would throw their hands in the air. And when they did that, we would open up our backpacks, take out great controversy books, and start throwing it out into the audience. <laughs> and let me tell you, the people were diving for them. Give me my book. I mean, fighting. Over the great controversy, fighting. So the Bible says, in times of ignorance, God winks. And I could see God up in heaven like... (laughs) 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 Angels, just go bless them. And I know, just go, just go bless them. (laughs) Just go, just go. Times of ignorance, God wings. And we would find creative ways to do evangelism. So as a hip-hop artist, you know, you'd have girls that would be like, oh, you know, yo, can we come back and, you know, chill in your room? And, and so we were like, oh, you want to come back and chill in the room? Yeah, yeah, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> so we go back to the room, get in the room, lock the door. Bam, open your Bibles, all right. No, 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 sit down right there. Here's what we're going to do. The Bible says, no, 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 stay right there. The Bible says. So, <laughs> in times of ignorance, God winks. And God was using us. God, and, and, and so what happens is like we began to, and I need to try to make this, uh, there's so much I'm cutting out here, but, but let me tell you, the Lord brought us to a place. Huh. I, I'll tell you a funny story real quick. So we got, end up getting baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Like, I, probably like 20 of us or so were baptized into the church. And, and God has a sense to me because when I was baptized in the church, it was, I was baptized in, in Kingsborough uh, SDA Church in Brooklyn, New York. 
So when I was baptized, it was a black church. I thought that Adventism was a black movement. So I remember when I saw my first white Adventist, I was like, look at that. What? The gospel's going into all the world. <laughs> yeah, baby. I was like, you know this movement is powerful when a white man joins a black movement. <laughs> I can imagine that white Adventist looking at me like, what's the matter with you, man? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, God was doing amazing things, and he began to change me. Like, he began to, I like to say the Lord began to heal me because we would smoke marijuana, and, my, you know, we were like, you know, Lord blessed all herbs, but then God began to show us, <laughs> your body's a temple, you know, and, and he, 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 like, pulled my pants up. That was amazing, man. That was amazing. Boom, like, right on the waist. And um, God changes you, man. And, and you know, I, I like to say that God healed me as well because before I came to, the, to Christ, I had a problem with the way that I walked. And, you know, after I came to the Lord, like, he fixed me and I was able to, like, just walk normal again, you know, like a normal person. And so God did all kinds of things in my life, man. Took away cursing, you know, all these different things. Like God did some seriously amazing things. And then he brought my brother and I to the crossroads where he was like, listen, you know, you cannot serve light. You cannot walk in light and darkness at the same time. You see, the Lord brought us to a place where we had to make a decision whether we were going to stay in the industry or come out of Babylon and serve him. And my brother and I independently made that decision. We left behind that million-dollar contract. And uh, we, we never, never looked, looked back. I changed my name one more time. <laughs> Ivor. The name means archer. <sighs> And I was like, all right, Lord, you know, because remember, like, I, I, you know, my fear of public speaking in the hip-hop industry, you can put on a show, you can act hard, and do, but to, like, actually speak before people, like, just, that was my, I was like, Lord, and, and, and the Lord said, this is what I'm calling you to do, I'm calling you to be my archer. Identity. Identity. I just learned yesterday, we went on a little tour, and I just learned yesterday that my name, Ivor, is actually from Wales. Wow. How about that? <laughs> but it means archer. And it's amazing because I saw something else. When I was studying the Bible once, I saw that the letter X was, the Greek letter X uh, was used to represent Christ. And I was like, wait a minute. So if the Greek letter X, like, you know, Xmas, Christmas, wait a minute. If the Greek letter X, wait a minute, wait a minute. So I can still be an X man? I was like, God, you are good. You are good. I I'm an X-Man. I'm an X-Man. I'm an X-Man. I, I love that. God, God took me out of all these dark places and made me a new creation. So, 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 that's my testimony. I just like kind of juice it down for you. But I want you to check this out, guys. You see, the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation right it kind of reminds me god is a creator is that right and, and, and if we want to know how god creates all you need to do is go back to the creation week to see how he creates because i want to tell you something that that before god came into my life i was uh in darkness void empty y'all not feeling me <laughs> but then god said let there be light <laughs> And beloved, when there, that's day one. When there was light, I, I can see and begin to see how God was working in my life and doing these things, leading me to where day two talks about the water. God baptized me. You see, beloved, day three, the Bible says, fruit began to come forth. And I can realize, whoa, God began to bring forth new fruit in my life. Day four talks about the, 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 the greater light and the lesser light. And I was like, whoa, God has just given me a new light to guide me. The greater light, Jesus Christ, and the lesser light, the Bible. Not to mention the spirit of prophecy. 
on day five, the Bible says that, 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 that uh, uh, he created the fish, and I can see, well, God was calling me to be a fisher of men. On day six, he said, I'm going to recreate you in my image. You're going to become a new creature in Christ. And on day seven, he said, I've just made you. I have given you the Sabbath to remind you what I have just done in your life. Beloved, your creation story is in the creation story. I don't know what day you're in, but God is trying to get you to day seven. You see, beloved, listen, I want you to understand this. The Sabbath is more than a doctrine for me. Okay. The Sabbath is not a doctrine for me. The Sabbath is a reminder for me that God recreated me. And that he drew me out of Egypt. Okay. Okay. You see, beloved, you can't celebrate the Sabbath if you're still in Egypt. What did you call yourselves? Seven, what? Seven, oh, you think keeping the Sabbath means you come to church on Saturday? Is that what you thought? No, beloved, keeping the Sabbath is a sign. And a sign signifies that something happened. So check this out. If you have not been recreated, okay, hold on. If you have not been recreated, if you are still living life in Egypt, you cannot keep the Sabbath. It doesn't matter if you come to church on Saturday. That's not keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a sign. It's a celebration of an anniversary. But if you, if, if you are still in Egypt, what are you celebrating? Do you catch what I'm saying? The Sabbath is God's way of showing that he has created you anew and delivered you out of Egypt. So if you're still in Egypt, if you're still in the world, you can't be an actual seventh day. You are on the books. Don't get me wrong. But the name signifies something. It signifies that God brought you out of Egypt. If you're still in Egypt, you cannot keep the Sabbath. How can you celebrate something that never happened? Did you catch what I just said? How can you celebrate something that never happened? Now listen to me. How did Israel get delivered out of Egypt? The Bible says that God came down to them. Is that right? Are you with me? Does the Bible say God came to them? All right, come, come. Let me show you something. Turn with me to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Yeah, yeah, John 14. And, and you need to see this. This is, this is, you need to check this out. John 14. Remember how Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go, I will do what? I will come again. How many of you believe in the second coming? How many of you believe in the second coming? Let me see your hands. You believe in the second coming. All right? And let me see your hands if there's nothing that can deceive you about the second coming. Right? No one can tell you, right, that the second coming does not occur the way that it occurs. Check this out. Come with me. John 14. John chapter 14. And notice verse 16. John 14, verse 16. So, so the Bible says here, And I will pray the Father, he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Stop. Hold on. Wait a minute. Did Jesus say, I go to prepare a place for you? Yes. Did he go? Yes. All right. So he went. Yes. Now we're expecting him to do what? Come again. What did he say right here? Did he say, I'm coming again? I will do what? Come to you. So does Jesus come a second time? How? How? Through the Holy Spirit. Okay, hold on. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. 
How many of you want to be ready for Jesus at the second coming? If you want to be ready for Jesus at the second coming, you need to experience the second coming. Okay. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. If you want to be ready for the second coming of Christ, you must first experience the second coming of Christ. Okay. <laughs> the Bible says he comes with clouds. Is that right? Do you know that the Bible says that Jesus, that the Holy Spirit, that, that Christ would send the, the latter rain, and it says that he would send the latter rain with clouds? So let me ask you, when the Holy Spirit comes to you, comes as a latter rain, is it like a cloud? Does Jesus come with the clouds? So when Jesus comes to you, is he coming to you through the person of the Holy Spirit? All right, now watch this. Does every eye see Jesus when he comes? Does every eye see Jesus when he comes? So if someone tells you that Jesus came, but you can't see it. Oh, no, y'all not feeling me mad. you not feel. If, 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 if someone tells you that Jesus has come, but you cannot see it, it is a lie. It is a lie. Jesus does not come in secret. Adventists are being deceived. Adventists are living a rapture lifestyle. Oh yeah, he came, but it's secret. You can't see him in me. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's a secret. Beloved, the Bible says every eye. If someone has to tell you, oh yeah, you know, I, oh, I think he's a Christian. Every eye shall see him. Check this out. When Jesus comes again, what happens to the wicked? <laughs> what happens to the old man when Jesus comes again? The old man, the wicked man dies. Has Jesus come again? I'm just asking you. Have you experienced the second coming? You see, beloved, the doctrine of the second coming, the literal second coming is a picture of what must happen in us spiritually before he comes again. It's not just a doctrine. The Sabbath is a sign of something that has, our identity has changed. If our identity has not changed, we have no, we can't keep the Sabbath. How can you sing the Lord's song? Oh, wow. Beloved, when Jesus comes again, the righteous are brought to life. Come on, man. When Jesus comes again, the righteous are brought to life. Amen. So when Jesus comes to you, what happens? The old man perishes by the brightness of his coming. And the new man is raised up from the grave. Wait, not only is raised from the grave, the Bible says that we are caught up into heaven. No, 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 no. no, no. No, are you catching this? Are you ca Beloved, our doctrines are not just for mental stimulation. Our doctrines are designed to change our identity. Our doctrine, the second coming, is designed to destroy the old man and raise up the new man. So now the Bible says we are lifted up into heavenly places with Christ Jesus now. That only happens at the second coming. Oh, man, you guys are mighty quiet. You feel, it sounds like your Adventism is being tested. Because you just thought that as, as long as you believe these doctrines, you're okay. No, beloved. The doctrines are designed to change your identity. When, when Jesus comes again, check this out, guys. Satan is bound. Okay. Nah. He is not allowed to roam around like he used to. Have you experienced the second coming of Christ? Because if you want to be ready for the second coming of Christ, you must be ready for the second coming of Christ. But wait, there's more. Because look, you know the other doctrine we talked about, the second death? Remember that, the second death? Listen, when the Bible says the wage of sin is what? Death. Let me tell you, my old man, that old man that you saw on the screen, he is gone. You want to know why? Because the second coming happened. 
That's what happened. That's what made me a new creation. Why do I keep the Sabbath? Because God delivered me from my old Egypt. You can't keep the Sabbath if you're still in Egypt. You can't be ready for the second coming of Christ if you have not experienced the second coming of Christ. But watch this. All these teachings are designed to change your identity. Because check this out. The Bible says the wage of sin is death. So when God uh, uh, said to Adam and Eve in the, in the garden, you will surely die, and they ate from the tree, God pronounced the first death upon them. It's the first time death was pronounced. Are you with me? Now check this out. The Bible says, how many of you want to die the second death, by the way? Does anyone here want to die the second death? You want to avoid the second death? Let me tell you how you avoid the second death. The Bible says that Jesus, God pronounced death upon Jesus. Jesus died on our behalf. So you know what that means? When, when he died on our behalf, he was dying for us. He was dying in our place, but not just in our place. He invites us to die with him. Are you with me? So look, in the garden, God pronounced one death. But now he says, hey, listen, there's a way you can escape the second death. It is by dying the second death. No, 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 no. Focus with me, guys. Jesus dies a death and says, hey, the first death is already pronounced upon you, but there's a way of escape from the second death. You must die a second death. Wow. <laughs> Jesus Christ's death is the second death that allows us to escape the second death. Yes, yes. How does that second death happen? It happens by fire. No, 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 you didn't catch that. Because Jesus said that he was going to baptize us with fire. You die. <laughs> no, man. I keep forgetting that silence is the new Adventist excitement. <laughs> I always forget that. I, I got to remember my experience in church 22 years ago. <laughs> Jesus dies so that we may experience a second death. That second death, there is no return from. Guys, check this out. Yoda is not coming back. He died the second death. There is no return from, yeah. <laughs> there is no return from that. So if someone comes back, it's spiritualism. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's, beloved, listen, these doctrines are not meant to just help us to know, all right, be aware of it. Listen, they are very personal. They are very Christ-centered. God is telling us, I'm trying to change your identity. I need to know that when the dead die, they know nothing. Their memory is forgotten, so they don't hold on to grudges. <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. The second death, there's no return from it. So, yeah, God wants you to experience second death now. So, yes, there may be some weeping and gnashing of teeth now. <laughs> but I'd rather weep and gnash my teeth spiritually than weep and gnash it literally. Because, you see, beloved, there are two cures for sin, and we get to choose. One is the second death now. Ah, a little painful. Oh, <laughs> weep, 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 weep. But at least I get to live. The other is the actual second death. They're both cures for the virus of sin because the virus of sin cannot survive in fire. Fire destroys the virus. So God says, I can spiritually burn you now. You're yeah, not feeling me. <laughs> I can spiritually burn you. You know what? How many of you hear the word hellfire and it sounds bad? Hellfire. That sound bad? Let me ask something. Church fire. Does that sound bad to you? No, 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 church fire. There was a church fire, right? Is that bad news? No, 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 no. Think me, literally, literally, church fire. Is that bad news? Why? Because the fire destroyed the church, okay? House fire. Bad, right? Why? Because the fire destroyed the house. Hell fire. 
y'all should be rejoicing about hellfire. Because, I don't know if I should say this, but God is trying to burn the... <laughs> out of you. Because <laughs> we all have some hell... We got some hell in us. And God is like, I got to burn this thing out of them so that they are saved. Hell fire, beloved. Hell fire. That's what God's trying to do in us. So now we know, listen, we know, okay, hell fire. I get it now. What happens literally must happen to me now spiritually. The old man must die, must become ashes, nothing left of him. So present your bodies a living sacrifice so that all that is left of the old man is ashes. I've given everything to him. A whole sacrifice, not a half sacrifice. Wow. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. The dead know not anything. You know, Jesus was on a cross, and when he died... The, the Roman soldiers were not sure if he was dead. And so you know what they did? They took a spear. And they said, we're going to see if he's really dead because he died too early. So let's see if he's really dead. Now, if that were you and I on the cross, we weren't really dead. We'd be like this, trying to fake it. We would be trying to avoid the spear. The way that they knew Jesus was dead was when they pierced him, no response. Y'all not catching me. You see, we claim to be dead. The old man is dead, yeah. But when Satan brings out that spear, <laughs> we show that we're alive. Listen to me, guys. Uh, uh. Have you ever seen a dead person? Maybe just died on the road or something, and what do they cover them with? A white sheet. Is that right? How many of you want to be covered in white? Y'all not feeling me. <laughs> How many? The white sheet is for the dead. If you want to be covered in Christ's righteousness, you want the white sheet? You got to be dead. The scariest thing you can see is someone covered in a white sheet that moves. You want to know why we're scaring people away? Because while we claim to be dead, we're moving. Whoa, I thought you were dead. What was going on? That's what's happening. So when we talk about prophecy and we talk about that, that beast with the horns of a lamb that speaks like a dragon, we say, yeah, hypocritical America. But wait a minute. Can we be like that beast? Can we look like lambs? But when we open our mouths, we're speaking like dragons. Beloved, I'm closing. I'm closing. Just, I need you to hear me out, okay? Check this out. God is trying to cleanse the sanctuary. He's trying to cleanse the temple. He's trying to cleanse the temple of the record of sin. Do you get what I'm saying? You are the temple, are you not? Check it out. He's trying to cleanse the temple. Okay, okay. No, no, no. no, no. He's trying to cleanse the temple. All of these doctrines are designed to show us our new identity in Christ Jesus. So listen, can I have someone come play for me, please? Listen. <clears throat> When Jesus comes again, all this, all of this, beloved, you want to be transformed? It all starts with the second coming of Jesus. That's where it starts. You say, Pastor, how does Jesus come to me? Beloved, he comes. The Bible says in Revelation 3, behold, I stand at the door. And that's, the, <laughs> that's Jesus trying to come to you. The Bible says in the book of Matthew that when they see, the world sees him coming, the, 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 the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Do you mourn when Jesus comes to you? Are you like, oh no, here he comes. Why is he knocking at my door? Jesus knocks and knocks and knocks and knocks. He's saying, let me in. I want to deliver you out of Egypt. You, I, I know you're in church on Sabbath, but you cannot keep my Sabbath while you are partying in Egypt. 
And the only way I can get you out of Egypt is to come to you like I came to the children of Israel in Egypt. I had to lead them out. Beloved, it is a false sign. If you, you can't celebrate an anniversary with a woman that you never married. You're lying. You can't celebrate the Sabbath if you're still in Egypt. If you're still entertained by Egypt. If you're still doing the things of Egypt. So Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And for many of us, we don't want the second coming. We talk about the second coming, but we demonstrate it by rejecting the second coming. So now when it's our turn and the five foolish virgins go up to the door and knock, open up, open up, let us in. Jesus says, I never knew you. Why? Because when I was knocking at your door, you didn't let me in. And now you're knocking at my door. Beloved, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me. Depart from me. So look. I think something powerful needs to happen in England. How about you? I think God, I think the second coming needs to happen in a lot of hearts here today. I think there's some people here who have been living in Egypt, but coming to church on Sabbath. And today you're saying, Lord, change me. I want to be a new creation. I want to be a new man. I want to, I want to actually celebrate the Sabbath because many of us don't have anything to celebrate because we haven't allowed God to do that thing in our lives so I want to make two appeals listen the first appeal is this Lord I need a second coming to happen in my life now I need to throw the old man into the flame of God and you know how that happens? Jesus, John the Baptist said, it happens through baptism. I will baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and, will fi and with fire. That's what God is calling for. So today I'm asking, listen, if there is one person in here today, or 10 of you, or 20, there may be none, I don't know. But today you hear the voice of God saying, come on, it's time. You've been putting this off. Come on, it's time. Beloved, time is wrapping up. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. And if you want to be ready for him coming again, then you got to experience the coming again now. So you're saying, Lord, that's me. I want to give my life to the Lord. I, I need to be rebaptized or baptized. I'm going to ask, would you be bold enough to stand where you are? Stand where you are. Don't let the enemy keep you down. You know what? I know it's embarrassing because you're like, I don't want the people to look at me and think, but don't care about what people think. You're saying today, and it may not be you being baptized here today, it might be when you go home, but I'm saying make that decision today. Lord, I need to give my life to you. I'm ready. Would you be willing to stand? Come on, I know you're in here. Young people, I know, I know that God is speaking to you. It's always that first person. Who's going to be that first person? There you go, sister. Amen. Amen. Don't worry, I'm not calling you down to the front. Don't be ashamed of Jesus, by the way. But don't worry, I'm not calling you down to the front. I'm just asking you to stand. Amen, sister. I think you stood earlier, but praise God that you're standing again. Let people see that you're making that decision. Come on. Listen to me, young men. If I didn't make the decision to be, give my life to the Lord, I would not be standing before you today. God is trying to use some of you in this place, and he needs you to be bold enough to stand for him. Come on, don't let the Lord wait. Don't let the Lord wait. Praise God, my brother. Praise God, my sister. I know, I know you're in here. I know you're in, I know you're in the side. I know you're there. Because, beloved, too many of us are living out in Egypt for this place to be still right now. Come on. 
Come on. Praise God, my brother. Praise God. Come on, man. You want a revolution in England? Are you tired of people leaving the church and saying, everybody's leaving the church? Let the fire start with you. Let the fire start with you. My best, the guy that brought me into the church, he told me, listen, he, he was just wise beyond his years. I remember him telling me, listen, this is how you keep fire. Surround yourself with people that are on fire. He said, if you take a stick, a, bur- a stick and throw it in a bunch of burning sticks, what's going to happen to that stick? And I said, it's going to get on fire. He said, that's right. Always surround yourself with people that are on fire. Listen to me. Too many Adventists are environmentalists. You adapt to your environment. So you come to church, yes, I'm holy. And then you go out into the world, yes, you're just like the world. We need to stop being environmentalists. Stand for Jesus. Why would you be ashamed of him? Stand for Jesus. Look the devil in his eye and say, you're not going to hold me down. Stand for Jesus. I'm going to make another appeal. You may not need, you, you've been baptized, you're saying, I need to be baptized, but I need to rededicate my life to the Lord. That's me. I need to rededicate my life. I need the second coming to happen in my life. I'm going to invite you to stand where you are. This is not for everyone. I mean, I hope everyone stands, but it's not for everyone. Don't stand if you're not moved to stand. Today you're saying, Lord, things got to change. In fact, you're saying, I've never kept a Sabbath. My, I have the title Seventh Day Adventist, and I have never truly celebrated the Sabbath. And this week, I want to celebrate my first Sabbath. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. Lord, I need to be delivered. To get me out of Egypt, this Sabbath, next Sabbath coming, I will celebrate my first Sabbath. Heavenly Father, we thank you for speaking to us. We thank you, Lord for your amazing grace we thank you for your power to change lives and father we thank you that the doctrines of the seventh day adventist church are designed not just to give us head knowledge but to actually change who we are lord may we have a fresh new look at the word of god may we have a fresh new look at the beliefs that we hold because what we believe will have an effect on who we are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for promising that the old man will be ashes, that he never need rise again. Thank you, Jesus. May that old man truly die. May we no longer live in fear that he might come back one day. We give him to you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your amazing love. In your precious name we pray, amen.